I trust that you're all doing really well and really enjoying this series and growing from it. I want to continue with what we're talking about, and we've been talking about this over the last couple of weeks, uncommon prayers, uncommon prayers. And I want to share with you from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. The Bible says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That's so powerful. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Look how many times prayer is mentioned there. But I love this. In this scripture, we see the importance of praying with different kinds of prayer. Our prayer lives go to another level when we learn how to appropriately use different kinds of prayer on different occasions. In this series, I've mentioned that there are some kinds of prayer that are typically taught in the church. Namely, there's the prayer of faith. There's the prayer of thanksgiving. There's the prayer of binding and loosing. There's the prayer of agreement. There are different types of prayers. And these are all very powerful. But in this season, I'd like to emphasize some other kinds of prayers. And I'm calling them uncommon prayers. These prayers are uncommon in many parts of the church today. And last week, I began to teach on the prayer of consecration, the prayer of confession, and the prayer of relinquishment. And today, I'll continue with a fourth uncommon prayer, and that's the prayer of impartation. The prayer of impartation. In Romans chapter 1, verses 11 through to 13, the Bible reads, Paul is speaking to the church at Rome, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. In this passage, we see that impartation typically occurs when you're in close proximity to the recipient. Paul desired to be with them so that he could impart something to them. We also see in this passage that spiritual gifts are often received through impartation. And you see, it's so important to be aware of this because if we don't know how to pray this type of prayer, then we might actually limit the proliferation of the gifts of the Spirit in our midst. Could Paul not have just interceded for the church in Rome to grow in spiritual gifts? Whatever type of gift he was talking about, could he have not just prayed that it take, took place? But he says, I longed to come and see you. It seems to me that the prayer of impartation was necessary. This was actually something that Paul yearned for, if you think about it. The word long for here actually is the same as to yearn for. And when you know what you carry, you tend to yearn for an opportunity to pass it on to those you care about. Just think about it. He must have been so confident in the fact that there's something that he carried, right? That he had the, the confidence to actually say to them, I'm really longing to come because I know when I come, I'll be able to impart this to you. Paul obviously had this confidence. And the word see, when he says to see you in this scripture, it actually means to perceive and to attend to. I long to attend to you. That's the language of servant leadership, isn't it? The prayer of impartation is always an act of service. It's not to be carried out from a posture of superiority. Right? It's interesting that in verse 12, Paul actually highlights that they will be mutually edified and encouraged by each other's faith. Isn't that beautiful? It's not just, oh, I'm giving this to you. My name is Paul and you can't do anything to encourage me. No, he knew that he would also be built up by being there with them. The word impart is actually the Greek word metado, metado, which means to give a share of. So when you're imparting something, you're giving a share of what you have. 
So it, it requires generosity, doesn't it? Okay. The prayer of impartation stems from a generous heart. You're passing on a share of what you carry. And you know what? Often when we have low self-esteem, we don't know what we carry or we just underestimate it. The prayer of impartation requires us to uh, be so strong in self-acceptance and to be so free from the fear of man and to be so full of boldness. So important. The result of this impartation was that the people would be strengthened. It says, so that you may be established. And that word for strengthened, it's an interesting one because it means established. It means to make fast. It means to support or to prop. Could it be that God is calling you to pray this type of prayer more often so that the people around you are supported, they're held fast, they're propped up? Could it be that you've only been interceding for people, yet for some of them, you need to be shifting gears to impart something to them? It's such a powerful way of praying. Over the years, I've come to learn that the impact of the prayer of impartation is often dependent on the heart attitude of the recipient. It's one thing for me to want to impart something to someone. It's quite another thing for them to want to receive it or to think they can receive something from me. People who are bound by a stronghold of familiarity, they tend to struggle to receive impartation. If you despise the vessel, it's very difficult to receive anything from them. Just think about that. If you despise the vessel, it's very difficult for you to receive anything from them. I remember some years ago during a conference going to a restaurant with my pastor from my varsity days and we enjoyed our time together as couples and at a certain point it was time for us to pray and my desire was to receive a portion of what he carries. They asked that I pray first. So I'm asking them for prayer and then say, okay, but you open in prayer. You start praying. And something very interesting happened as soon as I began to pray. Because what happened was the power of God literally just hit me. They hadn't even started praying for me. Right? I began to pray and I, I forget exactly what I said, you know, but I literally fell to the ground. This is at this restaurant, one of those restaurants um, that we were seated outside. And so I literally fell like by the pavement uh, in front of people. And I literally began to shake like electricity was flowing through me. Power of God hit me so strongly. And this was all happening there, you know, in front of people. And it's interesting because when he was preaching on it some time afterwards, uh, he actually shared with some people and said that it was the first time this, is, this had ever happened to him, where before he starts praying for the individual, the, the recipient, uh, something is already taking place. And he literally said that it was as if I had located what was my portion, right? That was in him and I'd pulled it out. And so you see the heart attitude of the recipient is such a key factor in all of this. Could it be that there are many gifts, many gifts that need to actually be imparted, right? But you are missing out on those gifts because you despise the conduits that God has chosen to impart such spiritual realities. Just think about that. There are gifts that could flow from parent to child today, from husband to wife, wife to husband, pastor to church member, but they're hindered from flowing because of familiarity. The prayer of impartation in all these cases that I'm mentioning becomes ineffective. Something I also want to mention to you is that it's so important when we're ministering to people to actually know when it's time for a simple impartation and when it's time to use other types of prayers. And that's wisdom from God. A lot of ministers uh, of the gospel will break into supplication and intercession by default when God often just wants them to impart something that they carry. We are called to be stewards of spiritual things that we can impart to worthy recipients. Look at Luke chapter 10. I'm going to read from verse 5 to 6, firstly in the Berean Study Bible. Jesus is speaking. He is just, he's sending out his disciples, right? 
He says, whatever house you enter, begin by saying, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Powerful. So we are stewards of spiritual things. Peace is one of them. And we can actually impart it to people and to households. Often when I go to people's houses, I might, I, I might say something like, I leave my peace here. It's not a long prayer. It's an impartation. In, in the same passage of scripture in the NIV, Jesus says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Look at it in the NLT. When you enter someone's home, first say, may God's peace be on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they're not, the blessing will return to you. Again, very powerful. Firstly, it's important for me to note that the Hebrew word shalom here uh, actually means something broader than just peace. In essence, it's actually to do with universal flourishing, flourishing in all aspects of life. Okay, so it speaks of peace. It speaks of harmony. It speaks of wholeness. It speaks of completeness. It speaks of prosperity. It speaks of welfare. It speaks of uh, tranquility. All right. Today, we often say peace ups when we're greeting each other, right? Or in the 90s, people say, yo, peace in the Middle East. You know, they'll speak like that. But let's remember that um, this act of saying shalom was not limited to the absence of war, but it was actually a greater release of blessing. And it's so important for me to emphasize that. So it's interesting that Jesus said that this is the first thing that the disciples must do when they enter the house. So they're not doing it in response to how they've been treated. They're not looking soulishly at the people and then saying, huh, I'll leave my peace here or not. They're literally doing that as their default. Okay, they do that as they start. And so with that in mind, this passage of scripture is so useful because it shows us that an impartation cannot be forced onto an unworthy recipient. You know, in the same way that a curse without a cause cannot alight. That's what the Bible says. In that same way, uh, you can't just bless something that, is, that God has already uh, unblessed, right? You can't just, uh, you know, that becomes unsanctified mercy, right? And so I think it's so powerful. An impartation cannot be forced onto an unworthy recipient. If they're unworthy, it says that the blessing will return to you, right? The good news is that there are actually so many worthy recipients out there around us whom God wants to impart blessings to, but he's actually waiting for us to be conduits through the prayer of impartation, through the prayer of impartation. And this scripture actually highlights clearly that we are stewards of spe specific spiritual blessings, do you know what you carry? Do you know what God has given you to impart? For us to pray the prayer of impartation, we need to have a generous heart. We need to have generous hearts that are willing to share freely that which God has given us. Do you desire to see others walk in what you are currently walking in? Just think about that. Or are you stingy with it? The blessing, the gift that's on your life is not for you. It's for other people, right? That's why God gifts us. Here's an important principle. You cannot impart that which you do not have. If you don't know, right, um, what you carry, right, sometimes we end up just going into intercession, right? Because we don't know that we actually carry the glory of God, okay? If you know that you don't carry something, then rather intercede that God comes through for that particular person because you can't impart what you don't have. Are there unique dimensions that you walk in that God is calling you to impart to others? My wife will often impart the spirit of grace and supplication, for example, right, so that people can pray more easily. When she plays the piano whilst I'm ministering, for example, a river begins to flow, a spiritual river. I can feel it. And I find it so easy to pray when I'm in that particular climate. She carries this grace and it's something that she can impart. 
but you can't impart what you don't carry. What are the unique things that you carry? What are the unique things that you carry? Someone, um, uh, I was talking to someone quite recently. I said, I'm just amazed by how efficient you are. You know, one moment you're doing this, then you're doing this, then you're doing this. And this person said to me, but Pastor Paul, sometimes we forget what we pray for people because you prayed that for me. You prayed that I'm efficient in what I do. And I was reflecting on it and I realized, I think there might have been an impartation there because those who know me will say, Paul, how do you do all the stuff you do in such a short space of time? And maybe that's one of the things I can impart, right? Efficiency in terms of use of time, right? Productivity in terms of use of time. There's so many things that we carry that are actually a grace from God, a gift from God, and we've got the ability to impart them. In Acts chapter 3, I'm going to read from verse 2 through to 8. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention. Sometimes that's really important when, you, when you're praying for someone for an impartation. Expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Now, Peter had come to a place clearly in his life where he had come to a place of acceptance with regards to what he didn't have, right? He says, I don't have silver or gold. But he knew what he did have and that what he did have was far greater than money. You see, healing prayers, because this was a healing prayer, but healing prayers can be prayed in different ways. And here's an example of someone actually passing on a share of what they had and imparting healing. So a prayer of impartation can also be an impartation of the healing anointing, right? And that's what he did. He says, that which I have, I give to you. And there are times when we are praying for people, we're actually releasing, we're imparting something that we carry. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Do not neglect your gift. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. This shows me two ways in which an impartation takes place. The prayer of impartation often occurs through the combination of a spoken word and the laying on of hands. It's one of the standard ways that impartation takes place. You speak out what you're passing on to the other person, and then there's some kind of transference through the laying on of hands. That's the standard way, all right? Proximity. I received a, a message I want to share with you. I received it on LinkedIn from a gentleman we had interacted with about 20 years ago, and he said this to me. This was a few days ago. He said, thank you, Paul Nyamuda. Over the course of about 12 or so cell group meetings in a house belonging at that time to person X and Y, you and your wife helped shape my life for the decisions I needed help to make then. One of the most pivotal moments of my life was in a prayer line at such and such church. You came to me, tapped my shoulder, opened your arms, said to me, in the most authoritative manner I'd ever been spoken to, you said these words, whatever's in me that is yours, take it. After that, I never saw you again, but here I am. Thank you, Paul. That was the prayer of impartation that took place. And it blesses me when I see his profile and what he's doing today as an actuary uh, described as a Pan-African innovator and chief inspiration officer of a great organization. It's, it's amazing. But there was an impartation. There was something that took place there. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus said, 
heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Very powerful. It says, freely you have received, freely give. I want to say something so important. It is unbiblical to charge people financially for an impartation. I want to say it again. It is unbiblical to charge people financially for an impartation. What you are giving them is worth far more than anything money can buy. This is so important. You know, if people desire to sow financially into your life or uh, give you a gift in appreciation and honor, that's another thing. But on your part, you must never charge people for an impartation. It's impo that's important to understand. I will quite happily charge you for my professional services. That's fine. That's different. Right? But I'll never charge you for an impartation based on the grace that I carry. Okay? Sadly, on the African continent, certain practices have actually crept in, um, influenced by animism and other unbiblical practices. So um, some people were used to going to witch doctors, for example, where they, their belief was that, you know, the bigger the offering, then the bigger the breakthrough I will get, etc. And if I need a big breakthrough, I must give this witch doctor a big offering. And they've taken that mindset, that same mindset, and they've applied it to men and women of God. And it's very subtle. And some even believe that when they give sacrificially for the breakthrough, um, you, you know, despite the fact that only the, the only legitimate sacrifice was the sacrifice that Jesus actually made on the cross of Calvary, right? Um, so who ends up getting the glory in those processes? It's the person who's given the sacrifice. You know, they do for their big sacrifice. It's one thing for God to give you a word of wisdom that you must sow a financial seed in a particular situation. It's quite another thing for you to have a theology that states that your sacrifice is the source of your breakthrough. You know, Jesus and what he did on the cross, he's the source. He's the only source of our breakthroughs. There's some things we do as a point of contact of faith, for faith. There's some things we do uh, to get ourselves to another level of faith, etc. There, there are all sorts of things we do. But our source in terms of the breakthrough must always be the cross, must always be Calvary. I want to reinforce my point by sharing with you the account of Simon the sorcerer, just to show you that there are no shortcuts to being a glory dispenser who prays the prayer of impartation. There are no shortcuts. In the wickedness of our own hearts, we desire to walk in these things, but we're actually called to remember the sacred nature of, of this thing we're talking about, this type of prayer, and our need for brokenness and our need for purity. It's so crucial. So let's, let's talk a bit about Simon the Sorcerer. In Acts chapter 8, I'm going to read from verse 9 to 24. Very interesting passage. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. Okay, that's what often happens when people are in deception and using sorcery um, to actually do miracles. Verse 11, they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized and he followed Philip everywhere astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Isn't it amazing? When sorcerers begin to follow men, true men and women of God because of the miracles. I think that's awesome. And he followed P Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That's impartation of sorts, isn't it? Right? Now watch this. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given 
at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Given, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is happening today where people see someone greatly used by God and they're like, I also want this. What do I need in order to, what do I need to do? How much do I need to pay? They're acting just like Simon the sorcerer. Look at Peter's response. He said, Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. I think this is so powerful and such a powerful example of how, you know what, freely we have received, so freely we give, right? When you impart something to someone, don't seek anything in return, not even honor from them, not even attention from them. See, sometimes you might say, well, I didn't ask for any money, but you're looking for something. You're looking for some kind of loyalty. You're looking for some kind of attention, some kind of respect. Freely, you have received. Freely give. Jesus actually sets for us a great example when it comes to regular prayers of impartation throughout his ministry. In John 20, verse 21 to 23, it says this. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Okay. Now in John 14, 27, Jesus had already done something similar with regards to imparting peace, right? He had already said, Peace I give to you, not as the world gives it, do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So he'd already said that. And that's why it says, so again, Jesus said. This shows me that we can release an impartation multiple times because he's releasing peace again. It's not, it's not a once off. Jesus here now seems to impart not just peace, but also the Holy Spirit, right? It says he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So first it's receive peace, that universal flourishing. Then it's now receive the Holy Spirit. And then also some measure of authority to forgive sins. Okay? I believe that speaks of an element of church government that he was, he was actually addressing and saying, guys, this is the authority I'm actually giving you. It's interesting to also note that he does so through breathing on them. So next time you see a minister of the gospel blowing on people, don't be quick to judge us. Okay? I, I've actually found this to be very powerful when it comes to impartation, right? Uh, what you can do with your breath. Impartation is so important when it comes to sharing the burden also of leadership. You see, when you're imparting, you're not just imparting anything. You know, there are times when I'm praying for people and I feel just this unction to, and I begin to groan and it's almost like there's something deep inside of me that has to come out for the other person. And that prayer of impartation can be very powerful. But we see here, it's not limited to just peace. There's also uh, dimensions of the spirit and spiritual gifts. There's also dimensions of authority. And I want to give you a powerful example of this because impartation is important when it comes to sharing the burden of leadership. And I feel like it's something in the body of Christ we don't do often enough. We complain that these people who are supposed to be following my leadership, they're not doing A, B, C, D. But have you imparted something to them, given them a share of what you carry in terms of authority, in terms of the grace to lead? Look at Numbers chapter 11. I'm going to read from verse 16 to 17. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. 
They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. Could it be that you're a leader, but you've been carrying the burden alone because there's been no impartation of that grace to lead on some of the people who are working with you? You see, the grace to lead can be shared in ministry. It can be imparted. Sometimes the reason why leaders carry the burden alone is because there is limited impartation on others to share that particular burden. You know, we tend to pray the prayer of impartation only when it comes to spiritual gifts, but it needs to be applied when commissioning people into leadership. In Numbers 27, 18 to 20, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership. And lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eliezer the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. Are there certain people who are not being obeyed, right, by their followers because you haven't imparted what needed to be imparted? You know, and it's interesting in this narrative how Joshua already had the spirit of leadership. It says Joshua had the spirit of leadership, but Moses still needed to lay hands on him, right? You can be naturally gifted in certain areas, but an impartation can add another dimension that was not there. And I find it interesting because it says here that the spirit of wisdom was added to Joshua's life after Moses laid hands on him. If you look at Deuteronomy 34 verse 9, it says, Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom. Why? Did it just happen? No. Because Moses had laid his hands on him, so the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. It's amazing what the spirit of wisdom does. You know, it's interesting when Stephen was being martyred. What did it say? It says they could not resist the spirit and the wisdom by which he spoke. I believe that one of the things the spirit of wisdom does is it causes people to listen to you. It causes people to receive what you're saying. May God bless you with wisdom and with insight to know what you actually carry, what you carry from God as a steward. May he bless you with wisdom to know this. May he grant you the boldness the spiritual sensitivity and the compassion that's necessary to pray the prayer of impartation as you pass on and share that which God has given you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your power. Thank you so much for your authority. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives right now. Thank you, God, for what we carry. May you make us to be a generous people. May you make us to be a people, Lord, full of boldness and self-acceptance so that we pass on that which we carry. May we do so freely, not expecting anything in return. And may your church be strengthened as a result of the prayer of impartation. We pray this right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you.